Have you seen some of those humorous things that go around the internet? J.P. Sears has a video as part of his Ultra Spiritual Life series. What if meat eaters acted like vegans? Sitting at a table, he pushes away his steak and says to the person with the mound of lettuce on their plate next to him, that salad's totally grossing me out. I lost my appetite. Nothing. I got nothing from y'all. Okay. You, it's okay if you laugh. If you're offended, I apologize. That's not uh, the point. So I'll give you another couple opportunities. Oh, it's just not funny because you would really say it. Gotcha. Gotcha. At the restaurant, he orders the tofu spring rolls, but explains he doesn't eat tofu and asks if they have a tofu flavored chicken they can substitute. He remarks to a friend, plants give off oxygen. Why would you eat them? We need them. There's one on your screen now that says, sitting down to enjoy my vegan, gluten-free, soy-free, antibiotic-free, raw, non-GMO, organic, fat-free, low-carb meal. What's left is ice. I'm sure if you have lots of dietary restrictions, you've worked it out, and we don't need, mean to make fun of you, well, maybe a little bit, but, but we're still glad you're here and find food that's more calories than ice. Well, the Apostle Paul and his community didn't have Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or email. They did apparently have people who thought they were more holy or stronger because of what they ate or didn't eat. Paul makes the point in this chapter of Romans that we should not require others to share our convictions about what he calls disputable matters. He gives the examples of eating meat or not and of considering one day more sacred or not. You might have had conversations about whether you should go to church on Sunday or whether some other day is okay. This kind of thing is what Paul is getting at. Continuing the line of thought from the verses the three of us read, later in the chapter, Paul writes, The kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So Paul leads us away from contentious, divisive things to focusing on a life of goodness, peace, and joy together. The peace that we embody is more important than whatever we may find to disagree about or get offended over. So I might note that once peace and joy become secondary to our other concerns, Perhaps it's time to take a step back and reevaluate. Being peaceful people, however, does not mean being passive, especially if harm is being done. Peace requires harm to cease and accountability and healing to begin. So we gather here in peace. With each other, we share the table of peace. And then we go out in peace to extend it beyond these walls outside this campus. Here at Desert Skies, each week we have two intentionally peace-centered moments in our worship services at Houghton, even when we do not share the table of peace on a Sunday without Holy Communion. This series, of course, we are observing communion together each week, but other times first Sunday of the month. Even not on a first Sunday, we pass the peace of Christ to one another. This is peace here among the gathered community. And when we offer one another words and signs of peace, it's not just a flippant, sure, Everything's fine because it's easier than engaging and creating real peace. It's not glossing over the challenges. I read this week that the passing of the peace, receiving and offering the peace of Christ is as risky and demanding a piece of liturgy as any in our weekly 
practices. So what if this really formed us, made us people of peace? How would those who pass the peace of Christ to each other each week be different? How are we different? We practice offering peace to those with whom we disagree, those we find annoying or self-righteous, or you offer peace to the young person who wears a baseball cap in the sanctuary and slurps their coffee during the service, welcoming them as they are, perhaps having to make peace in yourself when your standards and preferences need to make space for someone new. Would such practice on a regular basis make a difference in our lives, our homes, our communities? Then we sing shalom at the end of the service, overtly sending ourselves and each other out in, with, and for peace. We commission each other to be peace builders when we step out. Do you know what shalom means? It's a Hebrew word, a biblical word, describing comprehensive peace, harmony, wholeness, welfare, all that God intends for the world. It includes positive, healthy relationship with God, peace among nations and people groups, a just society where all can thrive, peaceful interpersonal interactions. It also means peace in ourselves, inner peace, if you will, but not just the boring kind that comes to my mind sitting in meditation. Shalom is wholeness and integration for individuals where we can always be ourselves without second guessing, without self-hate, where we know who we are and how to live it out. So when we sing shalom to one another, we claim shalom for ourselves, receiving it as a blessing and a commission. We will do our part, we communicate when we sing shalom together. We will do our part to cultivate shalom in and for ourselves, as well as offer it to others. And this shalom thing may be fun and feel good when it's with our friends in a circle at church. But actually seeking and building shalom is hard work. But the work is not only ours, not primarily ours. God has done the work of peace in Jesus Christ. We receive and extend it, and the work is worth it. So to gather in peace and go out in peace doesn't mean we sweep things under the rug or pretend like we don't have differences of opinion or conviction. Rather, it means cultivating connection, friendship, and service across these differences. Pursuing peace may mean at times biting your tongue. And it surely means listening a lot. Truly listening. It may mean investing in relationships with those who see things differently than you do. Now, if you're wondering if there's a subtext here, if we're having all kinds of uh, trouble brewing, we're not. At least as far as I know, there's not a lot of conflict beneath the surface but the work of peace building is not always easy. If we find peace coming relatively easy, perhaps we've surrounded ourselves with people too much like ourselves. Maybe it's time to go make some new relationships, open our eyes, our perspectives a little wider. If this idea of listening and making space as peace building resonates with you, there's a United Methodist webinar coming up on listening 
Look for more information in this week's Skyline or call the church office. By the way, I'm so glad that I learned that our weekly email is called the Skyline because I always call it something different. The weekly email, the e-communicator, the e-blast, the, it's the Skyline. Did y'all know that? Okay, well, I'm a little late to the party, but now the Skyline is the weekly email. So, more information about a United Methodist webinar on listening. So, this peacemaking thing is no joke. We need supernatural help, which is why we frequent the communion table. John Wesley encouraged early Methodists to receive the Lord's Supper as often as you can, at least weekly. So John would be happy with this sermon series. We don't achieve that other times, but this month at least, John will be happy. Our elements today and our table and our altar rail Help us remember God's faithfulness in the past. The bread of communion is reminiscent of manna in the wilderness. It sustains us in ways nothing else can. It's a miraculous gift from God. It helps us make peace with each other, for there's no need to fight over resources. There's plenty. It helps us make peace with God, who takes care of us and with ourselves who are worth God's gifts. We remember God's faithfulness to Moses and the Israelites when they escaped from Pharaoh. God has been faithful and present in the midst of chaos before and is still with us at the table of peace. By the way, sometimes I don't, I don't always put back the communion table exactly like it was before the serving. And that's intentional because are our lives always tied up, always in a box with a bow and they're, they just look great? Everything is just in order? I don't know about your life or your home, but that's not always the case for mine. I need the reminder that God's grace and peace is present when it's a bit of a mess or a lot of a mess even the communion table. So if you've noticed that sometimes I don't always put it back all nicely, that's an intentional communication that God's grace is present. This is a table of reverence, yes. It's also a table that's in our real lives. It's not always completely put together. Indeed, God has been faithful and present in the midst of chaos before and still is. Thanks be to God.